Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome back to another episode from Scale Up Thursday series. My name is Rashmita and I'm the event planner for Microsoft Reactor India. Today, I'm here joined by our very own host, Vinayak and Vivek, and of course, our special guest speaker, Dr. Rimjim. But before we start today's session, I would request you all to read our code of conduct. Let me bring that in. We are all here to learn together, so please be respectful of other people's views, understanding of differences, being kind and considerate in the way you engage. The chat section is open throughout, and we do encourage you all to participate. Our speaker will answer all your questions during the session, so please feel free to drop all your questions in the chat section. With this, I would now like to thank you all once again and enjoy the session. Over to you, Vivek. Let me bring Vivek in first. Hey, Rashmita. Hello, thank you. Hi. Thank you for this welcome. And uh, folks, welcome to the Scale Up Thursday show. And I'm Vivek, a uh, senior cloud advocate from Microsoft. And um, I have Vinayak with me, who is going to co-host. So I just want to welcome Vinayak here. Hello, Vinayak. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Hi, I, I'm Vinayak Higre. I am the CTO in residence at Microsoft for Startups. And I help startups uh, uh, you know, choose their tech, tech stack and uh, scale up um, and also onboard them to Azure. Uh, so that's that's my role. Um, yeah, thank you Vivek, for having me. So who's who's our guest today? Perfect. So, so yeah, so we are going to have uh, you know, a very interesting person. Uh, Dr. Rim Jim here, and I was I was just chatting with her. I know she, uh, she is living a dream, uh, engineering dream, you know. Just before this uh, sh star show started, right? I was just talking to her, like, yeah, you you did engineering in bioinformatics, and then you know, uh, MTech in biotechnology, and then PhD in the same field. Um, most of our engineering folks, uh, students, you know, don't follow that, right? You know, if they are in different engineering, they change streams and become computer science engineers or, you know, become more into, uh, you know, do masters in uh, different streams. So, which is, which is really good. You know, it's a, it's a story which uh, all youngsters should uh, look into. If you're, if you're a young person who you are looking into the show, you know, you should learn from, uh, you know, Dr. Imjin here. So welcome Dr. Imjin for, uh, for the show, the Scale Up Thursday show. This is our fourth uh, episode, uh, and we have been uh, talking about different startups and understanding how they build and uh, how how they are. What's their been their journey in building, not just building the uh, startup, but also uh, their technical journey, right? So technology wise as well. So welcome to the show, and please introduce yourself. You know, I did a formal intro, you know, introduction, but yeah. Thank you so much for having me here. Hi, everyone. And this is a uh, really good opportunity that I'm uh, here to speak with all of you. So I'm really glad that we can do this. And thanks to you people for giving me the opportunity to talk. Yep. And today we're going to discuss uh, about how, uh, how to build a medical uh, startup, right? And uh, let me bring up uh, your your slides uh, here. Yep. So all yours, Rim Jim. So we are here to learn from you. Thank you so much. And yeah, so, uh, I will. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. So tell us a little bit, maybe about yourself and maybe the problem space you are solving, and uh, we can take it on from there. Sure. Sure. Please feel free to have the discussion interrupt me in between that is not at all a problem i would like to answer as much question as i can and uh, yeah let's quickly dig into this so majorly we are solving the lack of information in the neuroscience or i can say any brain related disorders right now doctors are having a lot of structural information um, where they can see tumor or they can see tracks but that too is not in a good resolution. They are lacking the functional information to perform any surgery or to do the treatment or to uh, for any uh, neurological as well as psychiatric disorders. 
and also for neurosurgery cases like glioma tumor epilepsy for all these they lack the functional information some of the very tertiary hospitals like um in enhance and um some like data memorial these people are having some of the functional information using task based fmri but other hospitals they completely lack it that is what we are trying to solve we are trying to get more and more information from uh, other neuroimaging modalities as well uh, that's why the major problem that neurosurgeons face is after surgery patient might lose the ability to speak or to walk or even cognitive functions cognitive functions like performing uh, basic tasks and understanding what is being told to them such critical functions are lost in neurological conditions like alzheimers the therapies are not very targeted so if we have more functional information the therapies will be more tar targeted and the medicines will be more targeted similarly in psychiatry most of the psychiatric disorders are functional disorder but we are completely lacking the fun functional information over there and to make this available to doctors uh, usually there is a neuro radiologist in the team who is sitting and deciphering all this which is still a very high intensive task because uh we use technology we need to use technology over here it is a multi dimensional problem and it is not very intuitive to humans only and that's why the biggest reason behind that all this information is not available brain is exactly like universe a lot is very complex you can see how staggeringly similar these two images are one is universe one is brain and you can see that one is in nano scale whereas another one is in light years though these are in different scales but there is a lot of similarities and complexity associated with it when we are dealing with such a huge complexity we need to have good technology on top of it to get the information done and the second reason is we uh, do have some uh, yeah jim uh yeah sorry sorry to interrupt so quickly i wanted to kind of you know take a step back and uh, you know you mentioned mris right uh, so for yeah. our audience uh, maybe many of us including me don't have a medical degree so what is it that you see in an mri right if you can maybe take a step back like what is it that you're measuring what is it that you're seeing maybe if you can just give a brief overview of what it contains uh, that would really help us uh, and uh, yeah if you're covering that later please let me know Uh, you know yes. that will cover it later yes i will just mention one more problem that we are facing about data uh, we do have data in medical imaging like there is structural mri functional mri dti pet scanning there are there is so much of data lying out there but data to information is also a pathway which is very intensive i would say it it requires because it is 4d data set 4d data set is time series data which is 3d right so it requires a lot of processing and munching which is not being done uh, just by radiologists it is very difficult we do have general radiologists 10000 in the country which is still very less in number and neuro radiologists are still very small in number we don't even know exactly how many we have but it is estimated it is somewhere between 30 to 300 which is extremely small number of neuro radiologists in the country and the uh, it is not just neuro radiologists neuro radiological researchers are also required who can uh, bring in the innovation to get such information right i will walk you through how the data looks like uh, there are three types of data set structural functional and dmri that we are dealing with we are getting the structural information from structural mri functional information from functional mri and the uh, fiber information of brain from dti now you can compare it with a google map you have destinations you have road map and then you have traffic map what right now is lacking is the traffic map which will make you delayed which will make you uh, wonder where you are moving and stuck in traffic if it is bangalore right similarly if you don't have information of traffic or the function in brain it will be it can be very difficult for doctors to deal with so we are bringing all these three informations together along with visualization using machine learning to get much quicker deeper and richer insights into the brain 
that's why we call it advanced neuro imaging and this can help in diagnosis management and rehabilitation just to give you an overview uh, this so is, so i have a yeah. i have one question here so basically you are trying to solve a problem which is after the surgery uh, on a specific problem so after surgery we want to know where exactly there is there could be a chances of something going wrong no no it is not just after the surgery let's say somebody came into a hospital with headache doctors uh, say that there is a tumor in the first instance when they go through neuroimaging they saw a tumor being there then they want to perform the surgery this is pre surgical planning itself they can do using this platform so one part they can do pre surgical planning so they will see where the tumor is near the tumor what all functions are uh, there which can get impacted when they are performing the surgery if it is a language region and tumor is very near by the language region it is required for them to understand it in much detail how much they can extract the tumor they cannot extract the full tumor if it is very close by they, because they will be hampering a very critical function but they would want to take away all the tumor as well to extend the quality of life so uh, it is about the benefit risk ratio they can see using this technology and they can then take a decision if they want to extract the complete tumor it is not at all harmful for the function or vice versa then how it is used after the surgery after the surgery once the tumor is extracted sometimes it is a uh, relapse of the tumor and a patient needs to go for another surgery in that case also it can be used another way is rehabilitation let's say uh, if the function was very near by the tumor and after, um, a while resecting there has been an impact that information is also needed if there has been an impact in the function then it can also be seen in the imaging and the reports that we are giving and again the action can be taken accordingly so for rehabilitation also it is very helpful they will also know, know what kind of function is uh, impacted like if it is a uh, language function which is impacted or it is cognitive function if it is impacted then they can target the therapies accordingly they can do more cognitive th- therapy instead of language therapies so in rehabilitation also it is useful got it thank you thank you for explaining that process yes um so these are the major three modalities and dmri structural mri and functional mri the data like i said is very complex we are trying to get as much of information uh, for structural mri it takes around 10 minutes which doctors are already doing in the mri machine right now with all the patients for functional mri we take extra 7 minutes because this is not a usual imaging modality that is being taken this is what gives us the maximum amount of information of the function this is called as resting state functional mri now the patient goes inside the mri machine just lie there for extra 7 minutes and it is a kind of video of the brain which is being captured uh usually when it is being captured all these reds and blues that you are seeing here it won't be there it will be a plain image and that is a plain video that is being captured over 7 min- minutes of time period and uh, then there is dmri uh, which is the fiber information you can call it as a road map of the brain which is being captured again the colors that you are seeing won't be there it will be a plain image after processing we extract all these information and color code it where they can see the uh, colors in the images that's why there are three levels of macro information that we are at present extracting one is the structural where we will be able to exactly color code and extract the area of the brain which is under study then there will be tracks of the brain and then functional region of the brain. this is how it looks like when a person is going into mri the structural mri looks like this it has a lot of information of what we call as uh, the destinations or region of interest in the brain the resolution will be very high for structural mri 
and in case of functional mri it is just a gray scale image it is li- like how the tv used to go bad and it will be gray and white it will just look like that and it will be around 150 to 160 time points because it is a video so we uh, talk about it in terms of time points and even after processing it will look like this which is non interpretable by humans so one major crucial step of here is denoising and processing of the images now functional mri is highly prone to noises because uh, in the mri person is just resting and they are not performing anything there are many outside the body noises as well as well as the noises associated with mri itself so the processing of functional mri is very intensive it requires around 24 steps of denoising and for structural mri it is around 10 steps of denoising then this is dmri which is giving us the road map where we can see all the tracks and details using the diffusion of water in the brain so collecting all these three we do the processing and we divide the whole process into four segments one is the data cleaning which i told you about denoising then the extraction of the signal once all the denoising has happened it is required to capture the signals now we capture the signals according to the frequency we call it band pass filtering and that helps us in coming to the exact signals we require to scrutinize after which we use these signals to do several inferencing it could be machine learning inferencing or a statistical inferencing we have several models on top of it where we are um depending on the use case we are doing several processing using machine learning and finally it is how we are visualizing it and how we are giving it to doctors to visualize so we are trying to create a 3d system right now we are giving the images how they are usually uh, very accustomed to look at it in the viewer which is again 3d but translating all the t- 2d information into 3d also is the last step of this process so how much how many data points you might need to build something like this so it depends on different part of this like for processing now we have processed um, more than 1500 files in functional mri now if you will think about it 1500 into so many 300 uh, three slices for each into the time points it is a huge data set of functional mri if we are thinking about that and if we talk about the structural mri it is much more in number so it depends on which modality we are taking yes it requires a lot of data set but a lot in medical data set is different than a lot in computer vision like if it is computer vision you will be looking into the images which is in lakhs however when we are looking into something like this lakhs it is not possible to get uh, one lakh uh, subjects to give us this much data set so mostly the information that we have right now is from around 1500 to 2000 subjects and then we divide it into several different sets for data cleaning and for machine learning algorithms it is running uh, for skull stripping we have thousands of images for skull stripping it depends on what exactly we are looking for in the use case for machine learning interesting also uh, uh, in the last slide i think you mentioned there was 4d so i am assuming that it's like the three physical dimension plus time is the fourth dimension right yes yes okay yeah this is actually quite involved i mean uh, um, yeah i mean this is fascinating because i think uh, as engineers uh, we never i mean in some sense we take our brain for granted but you know understanding the different parts of the brain and also how you are kind of translating in 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 not not in just of imaging but you how you are kind of denoising it um it it's 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 definitely very interesting right and then uh I remember some of my engineering days where you know we talked about this low pass and uh, high high pass band filter so it's also using a lot of digital signal processing and image processing uh, which is actually 
quite unusual in even in machine learning flows we uh, i think it's probably in the medical field and other like manufacturing fields is where we see something very similar where it is like uh, in in obviously in manufacturing it's like more like fault detection but uh, here also it is fault detection but in a very very different context possibly yeah. Uh, but yeah definitely uh, fascinating um, yeah so maybe uh, uh, we would maybe want to talk a little bit about the uh, you know the process in terms of the architecture if you have that on one of the slides yeah sure sure we can talk about this completely so i am a person who works majorly in neuroscience and machine learning and uh, neuroimaging i will try to give you as much as information possible on the cloud structure as well and uh, uh, yeah so this is our overall cloud platform we are using all the components from azure as of now uh because we was we were part of uh, azure microsoft excelsior accelerator amplify and they have helped us to like they were also guiding us to come up with a lot of challenges and how to solve those challenges and with all the support of microsoft and excelsior amplify we would we were able to get to this architecture we have uh, two person in the team who are also looking into this constantly trying to make it better now the different components over here are uh, first we are a regulatory compliant company because we are in medical care and that's why we should get the data set from a compliant um, ui which is medi data for us medi data is getting us clinical data set and our ui right now is um, compliant because of medi data medi data gives the ui which in which you can put exact anonymization and the details where we don't see any patient details and similarly we have another collaboration with carpel so our front end usually is a third party like that and then we get the data where we are doing the file processing uh, then there is um, we are using it in pods then there is kubernetes which helps us in orchestrating all the services and it is going into queue now depending on what kind of service we are doing like for example changing the nifty file conversion into dicom file now these are all the formats of the images that we are getting from mri maximum used format across the world is dicom image but for analyzing we need to convert it into another format called as nifty is all the libraries that are out there plus the libraries that we are building all uses nifty format so we have a service which converts the file format then there are fmri services or the smri services dmri services and this is network mapping the final results that we see are of network mapping so it then hits to this particular pod and tumor segmentation whenever we are getting the use case where there is tumor the tumor segmentation also happens because doctor needs to know how distant a function is from the tumor and we want to calculate the distance distance between the uh, two points and tumor segmentation happens and then there are output queues which are um, finally it gets saved into the blob in azure and we generate the link to it that link is given back to the users and it also is up, um, get appear in the dashboard so that they can click and view all the results which are there if we can come back yes. to the cloud again yes please go ahead with your question uh, yeah, i have two questions yeah uh, so one is obviously um uh, uh, you probably have api integration to get both the data and you know um, give the link so how long does this uh, typical process take say once i actually pull the data from medi data or uh, the other uh, ui how long does it is this processing take and also that was the first question and maybe the second question is like you know uh, you have written this various services what kind of uh, language and what kind of framework are you using for that yes so one it depends on the type of data that we are analyzing so for example if a use case come that is what we are doing in very initially here when we are doing the file processing and other services over here we get to know if uh, this is just so we get to know whether 
this is a glioma use case or we get to know whether this is alzheimer's use case and depending on that the pods are triggered now if it is just dmri and structural mri it takes 40 minutes to process and give all the information if it is along with functional mri it might take slightly more around 1 hour uh, for us to generate all the reports on the cloud however right now there are some manual intervention with doctors since we are working with 20 hospitals now and we are still coming out of our mvp stage to building all the features doctors are requiring we do have a manual intervention at the end where we discuss the details and doctors also need to understand how the reports are right now given to them so that small intervention happens at the end of it uh, which takes according to doctors time it takes some time for us so we actually tell that we will give you back the report in one day interesting and uh, what languages and frameworks do you use for these services like so machine learning all the codes are in python apis are in uh, java and front end some of the component of front end are in angular and yes that pretty much it there the, there is a similar um, question in the, in the in the chat yeah. basically so which is related to this so i just wanted to bring that up uh, so basically the question is uh, on the data sets so where it is hosted it is in local or on prem uh, i think you answered that but again i just want to make sure it is clear to the uh, audience yeah. it is not on prem as of now i will actually deal with that question uh, in much more details we are facing some problems which is like some challenges are there based on non on prem on on prem because doctors are slightly wary of uploading the data just like that on any cloud platform i will go through how we are dealing it in, in the next few slides yes so this is an other slide which talks about we are how we are showing the pre surgical planning results um so the green red blue green is the motor area blue is the language area red is the visual area how it is uploaded is over here they can just select the dicom folder upload it and this will be the dashboard the dashboard will have patient id there will be name which will be appearing to the specific logins age all the other metadata related to the patient and what files they have uploaded so there is possibility of uploading all these new amazing files and all these gets processed and give them a uh, really holistic information if let's say they are not uploading one or two of this let's see let's say they have not uploaded resting state then at least we will process these and give them information about rest of others or if they are missing out on dti then we will process resting state and structural and give the information accordingly now this is how the results look like if it is dmri which is the road map it is one of the very important fibers in the brain you can see if there is tumor here doctors can see uh, how the fibers are moving next to the tumor this is real image of a real patient came to us for processing you can see here there is a mild deformity and the lesion is having language region very nearby and these these are usually scrollable image they can go in and out i will show you in the report how it looks like when it is dynamic this particular screen is a wireframe like this is a road map for us because we want to have all these features in our uh, dashboard data we are building towards it where we will have all the specific features of optic radiation uh, these are all the tractography specific details and these will be embedded in our uh, dashboard it is a road map for us we are going to build this next the at present the report that we are showing to doctors are these let me zoom in a bit so the first page usually the report is 
14 to 17 pages. The first page is a general information of the patient. Uh, this is a PDF dynamic report, which doctors can use just before their surgery on their mobile as well. And it is dynamic because we are embedding videos in the reports. And they can pause at any point of time and see how close the functional area is with the tumor. And yeah. Another thing which is very important is laterality. Um, so if a person is left lateralized or right lateralized, which means if I'm talking, I'm using left side of my brain. So I'm left lateralized for language. And if my tumor is in the right side of the brain, it is not going to hamper. They need to know how much a person is left lateralized or right lateralized. If they are bilateral, then there is possibility of hampering the language of the person. So this kind of uh, laterality index helps them to understand if they can extract the tumor in from the left hemisphere or right hemisphere without any difficulty. So uh, I had a question around this, and I mean, um, so uh, I think some of the literature that I've read, and I might be completely wrong here, is uh, if there is any issue with the brain, uh, what I heard is what I read is. Uh, maybe some other part of the brain. Uh, I mean, um, as I said, the left hemisphere or the light, uh, right hemisphere uh, can take over. Uh, so, you know, is it like in a normal person, it's kind of equally divided or even in a normal person, you can have like a left or right kind of bias. Uh, how, how, how does that work? Yes, so that is known as neuroplasticity. Now, sometimes if left is not working fine, slowly right can take over it. But it is not 100% that it will be possible. There are ifs and buts associated with it. Now, again, brain is a very complex system. In some people, it would be much more better recovery and right hemisphere will be able to compensate for it. We are actually working on some of the algorithm where we can estimate how the right hemisphere or left hemisphere can uh, compensate for whatever functional loss is happening. But... That said, neuroplasticity can work differently for different people. And at the moment when doctors are going for neurosurgery, at that point of time, they would require to have some information so that they completely don't take off the uh, functional region of the brain. Uh, nice. I, I, in fact, I was just trying to recollect, uh, you know, some of these things which where I've read that um, the, uh, for the re, uh, you know, for the people of viewing this, I think there is this really nice book uh, that is written for the lay person called "Phantoms in the Brain: uh, Human Nature and Architecture of the Mind" by uh, V. S. Ramchandran, which I read and found really fascinating because it explains in a lay person language maybe you know how uh, how what are the different kind of maybe disorders or challenges that the doctor has seen and you know how how they relate to the brain. So. I would highly recommend it if anybody is interested in you, you know, what, what Dr. Injin is probably saying as well. Yeah. Yes. So this is another, there are many such um, images embedded in the report, depending on what kind of region it is. This is language region. And here, the green part actually shows how it occurs in the normal person and red part is uh, the changes that has happened for this person. So doctors can also compare it with a larger population, how it looks like. And yes, there are for, I talked about language region first, then there are motor network, sensory motor network, and then there are visual networks, primary, secondary visual network, auditory networks, central executive network. Now central executive network, cannot be given through any other modalities. It can only be possible using uh, resting state modalities, which we are using. And likewise, there are around nine networks that doctors can see, which is not at all po possible to do in any other uh, modality as of now. So resting state gives nine networks to go through before performing the surgery, which retains the maximum functionality of the person. I will go back to the slides. So any other question on the 
structure cloud yeah so i just wanted to know uh, like you know what are you using for uh, orchestrating this entire uh, thing like uh, to make sure that like i, I remember you said that uh, depending on what is like the uh, possible uh, um, a problem uh, you trigger different kind of workflow so how how is that like you know orchestrated um, and maybe also talk a little bit about the report generation service, right? I, I think uh, it's, it's very interesting that you are, I think, generating a PDF file and then you're embedding videos and other things. So how does that kind of uh, work? Because that might be interesting to a lot of uh, other users in uh, different use cases as well. Yes. So as you can see, this is under future enhancement, we have a report generation. Uh, right now, when the process triggers, the orchestrator takes care of which pod it should trigger and generate the images. Now, the images that are coming out are in two forms. One, it is in the form of uh, tables. And second, it is in the form of masks. So the area which you were seeing in red and different colors, those are just the mask. It gets overlaid on the structural MRI, the base image that is there is the structural image. On the structural image, we are overlaying all the masks. So once the outputs are here, uh, then there is another pod, which is which we are still working on. So that pod is uh, generating, overlapping these two images and putting it one on top of another. And again, there is like uh, orientation correction and uh, the all the three dimension should be checked. All those things are taken care of. And then on top of it, we are putting all the text and uh, tables which are getting generated. Like for literality index, we need the number. So after this, we are putting another, we have another pod, which is you know, triggering the report generation services. In that pod, we have this overlap, which is going to a viewer. Now we are using MRI Crow GL viewer to overlay these two images on top of each other and to take the video of it. Now this video part right now is happening in all the three uh, directions, the X, Y, Z coordinates, which I just showed how the videos are moving. In all the three coordinates, it moves and the video is captured. And then that is being overlaid on the report. Uh, still, we are making some mistakes on this, which is why some human intervention is in between required to correct those mistakes. However, as soon as this will be ready, we um, we are going to make it end-to-end -end process. And right now, with this manual intervention, we are giving the reports to doctor. Got it. There are a couple of questions, actually, in the chat. So. Yes. I just want to make sure uh, we take them as well. So there is a question on uh, is your research or white paper or case studies published? And if you have any specific links, if you can share it with us, uh, that will be great. Uh, that's what somebody has asked for. And a uh, couple of questions on. Um, yeah. So, uh, so on the, the question. Papers... Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I will take that first question because we need a lot of validation. Actually, I will go through the validation slide first. We need the validation to do on underlying science where we need to publish paper, science behind the product and the algorithm. Now, if the processing is correct, we again need to publish paper. Processing of the data set, if it is correct or not, that also metrics that we are considering. Like if we are saying that it is denoising, what is the signal to noise ratio? What is, uh, there is some uh, spatial noise ratio. So all these ratios we need to calculate and also publish those details. Inferencing done on the models, the inferencing like if we are saying glioma uh, use cases, which I just showed, those we call it as inferencing. So those validations are also required. Now we are dealing with AI and the medical uh, people, medical segments of the people, they don't understand AI as much as uh, we do. And that's why we need to explain why machine learning is saying anything. That also we need to publish the paper. 
details of the clinical trial we are working with 20 hospitals as of now and all the details in the clinical trial we are publishing as and when whenever we get any observation we are putting it for publication then scientific and clinical papers software features validation it is a user validation which is required product validation market validation as any other companies or startup will do so usually in a startup you will see last three happening but since we are in very cutting edge plus medical science these are the added validations that we need to do and we are publishing for papers for most of it and mm. yes i will Got be it. to show whatever paper details yeah, so we have I, yeah i just wanted to actually add on one thing right like i think um if you read some of the popular press i think there is this um, uh, maybe um in some sense i would say fear being created that you know ai is going to replace humans robots are going to replace humans but i think uh, dr himjim what you kind of nicely have actually showed us is that you know it's not necessary to replace humans but actually uh, humans and computers can work really together to you know augment what we already uh, already kind of uh, know or like you know kind of enhance right in that sense uh, so that is like fascinating right so how you're working with the doctors there is also a human in the loop uh especially because this is concerning humans and especially uh you know something as complex like probably like the brain or the heart uh, you know where even medical uh, research is happening in those areas and you know those parts are not completely understood as well uh you know how how that interface kind of works is like especially for the lay person for somebody like me or vivek is like very fascinating because uh, this is one aspect like you know we typically go to the doctor when you know something doesn't kind of work right or we are not feeling well mm -hmm. but i think the thought process around actually augmenting uh, you know how doctors kind of work and how medical research can be kind of in some sense translated into you know cutting edge machine learning is actually very fascinating for us and and especially the augmentation part uh, with uh, like because one of my questions was also like you know going to be like when you're comparing say you know what parts of the brains are functioning well or not uh, and i think you answered it to some extent what is like the baseline right because sometimes even establishing a baseline is also not an easy task because there's so much variance in the human uh, brain just as there is uh, variation in all of us to some extent right absolutely absolutely i completely agree one there is no possibility that we can replace doctors this is just to augment doctors final decisions are taken by doctors themselves and they might still discard some of the decisions that are being made by a tool and very rightly so because they are the person who are actually looking at the circumstances of the patient and other details which we are missing out on we deal with only a specific set of data we cannot include all the variability till there is 40 to 15 50% of impact on any disorder of the environment we cannot an analyze anything from the environment and include it over here until we have those variables captured and which is very difficult to capture so it is not possible to replace any of the doctors it is always helpful to augment them now doctors in india specifically given such a huge population they are seeing hundreds of patients like uh, a psychiatrist in india would be seeing 100 to 120 patient in a day however in us when there is enough number of psychiatrists they are seeing 20 to 30 patients in a day. how overworked are indian doctors and i think the technology like that this can help them in understanding the functional details much more faster instead of going through several iteration with the patient so this is just to augment them and not to replace them as you rightly said and yes uh, vivek you had another question on the screen right so do you want yeah. to bring that up yeah so the so the question is uh, basically this technology is used to identify mild cognitive impairity or impairment uh, okay. or uh, early signs of symptoms i was yeah. also about to talk about another yeah. use case so this first use case i told you about was in surgery now it can be used for epilepsy as well because it is also a surgical use case and uh, traumatic brain injury so that, those are all the neurosurgical cases now the set of use cases are in neurological disorder and psychiatric disorder as well one example of neurological disorder is dementia itself which a huge population is going to deal with coming soon and 
the major problem over there is to have a differential diagnosis of whether it is mild cognitive impairment or it is alzheimers or frontotemporal dementia one of our projects that is going on right now is to distinguish between the frontotemporal dementia and alzheimers disease and for that we are using this kind of uh, architecture where we are doing uh, parcellation of the brain then concatenating all the details of from different parcellation which gives us a very huge multidimensional data set and then we reduce it using uh, pca then logistic regression this is an ensemble model of logistic re regression and support vector machine which is stacked over each other and that gives us whether this person has mild alzheimers or it is normal and just having mild cognitive impairment this is another project that is running right now uh, which we have not deployed in several hospitals because here we require a larger data set and there are several difficulties in the data set over here because right now doctors are not getting patients immediately when they are suffering from mild cognitive impairment uh, people usually reach out to them once it is in severe stages so the data uh, recruitment itself is a larger problem over here we are trying to solve it through several of our programs like there is kokoro where we uh, do recruitment of the patients using uh, our programs so that is more of a community effort that we are putting in this particular project and again since it is uh, more on the functional end we also want to explain it much better to doctors as well these are some of the ways how we explain them all the features that have con concluded why this person is classifying as alzheimers and not as a mild cognitive or healthy person you yeah. so like this is another use case that we are working with but this is not near commercialization as of now this is a research project which will come out of r and d after one one and a half year uh, so dr ramjin i would want to talk a little bit about the uh, you touched upon this a little bit but i want to talk about the process of you know validation let's say uh, you talked about dementia let's say if you want to talk about say alzheimers or parkinsons or any of the other uh, issues uh, how do you how do you start off with a hypothesis you know like that what you have seen from your uh, personal experience of talking to doctors and how do you kind of in some sense i would say productize it and how do you kind of you know build a different layer so like what is like a typical press thought process what is a typical product process that you go through can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? sure sure so we actually first started from psychiatry because my expertise were in psychiatry my phd was in psychiatry for machine learning machine learning for psychiatry and that is where we started however we saw that neuroimaging is not very often used in psychiatric disorders and that became a bottleneck to uh because it was a behavior change you know psychiatrists will also need to send uh, all their patients for neuroimaging which was uh, slightly difficult in that case what we found that alzheimers has more patients who are going for the imaging modalities and that's why we started looking into alzheimers but however there are early stage capturing difficulty in the case of alzheimers that's why we thought of solving this Finally, we started getting requests from the neurosurgeons who are in the same hospital, and we started working with neurosurgeons in parallel. We started doing all the background uh, checks for the science of it because science we are the people who have to answer about the science. Doctor can just tell us what they require. They told us that they don't have information enough information for the surgery and all those problems that I discussed before. and we came back with those problems we start and we did all the background science for it we have in house research team of four to five people who are looking into the science day in and day out they look, look into all the major use cases that we can deal with and what would be the requirement re for that use case so those details are thrashed out then it is iterative process we go back with those information and talk to all the stakeholders all the advisors and give their points and come back and work out it again and go back to the hospitals again we reach a particular part where it is enough understood we also check for the technology feasibility then it goes to the technology team they uh, we put in experimentations to uh, 
uh, do the pilots to understand or do a poc and see if it is feasible to uh, do this particular use case using any technology that we are having with this we go back to the doctors and show them the results if they say yes we go back and like start building it in the product in terms of validation how we do it is again collaborating with the same set of hospitals uh, they give us data same set or depending on the use cases different set of hospitals so for example if it is uh, the use case of uh, glioma then we need around 60 to 50 patients from each hospital to see if it is uh, what we are giving and what they expected to result and expected uh is it similar or there are some specific scientific techniques that can help in validation we put in those techniques for some x number of patient to do the validation and then we publish it after publication if we we need to also show the replication of it or the generalizability that's why we try to do it on a larger population uh, or in different parts of india or in the world to give the exact uh, validation that this is this is a replication study or this is the baseline validation study and likewise we repeat the process with all our use cases okay do you do you have any hospitals that you are working outside of india uh, right now uh, so for outside india no right now we are not working outside the india however we are because one regulatory compliance which is required is even for right. research we need fda research compliances which we are in the process of uh, fulfilling all the requirements we are in uh, talks with around five different institution and hospitals in us and uh, once that clearance has happened we will trigger all the uh, research work and the pilot work over there Cool. Um, uh, Vivek, are there? Uh, this is really good. Vivek, are there any other questions in the chat right now? Yes, uh, there is a question on monitoring dashboard, which tool you are using, but I'm not sure which monitoring he is referring to. Probably the one which you showed uh, in the dashboard where you were showing the monitoring stuff. I think that is something which in the demo. I think. Not sure. Look, so, so Tarun, if you can share. like which mon where exactly you were looking for we can talk more about it but then yeah, until so then we is, can just go ahead yeah. yeah this is just a general philosophy of our company to be a responsible ai now because we are in technology and it is in medical science there can be a lot of thing that can go wrong we want to be as much fair as we can with highest data privacy and security and we want to explain what we are doing at every uh, stage and that's why we want to create explainable ai even in the reports and model we want to explain as as much as we can so that everything is very clear and validation i have already covered yeah one part i wanted to touch upon is since this is a medical technology on the cloud what are the challenges that we usually run into um so one is the logistical challenge like it is not that one person needs to go somewhere and upload the data set but what happens the mri the place where usually mri is kept in a hospital is very secluded it will not receive any network most of the hospitals there will be no network in the area where the mri machines are kept because they want to avoid all the interference of all the other signals in the atmosphere and that is why they cannot upload it immediately to the cloud and until and unless it is coming to our cloud it is very difficult to do a lot of processing like qa qc even to do the qa qc we need to understand if this uh, image is correct let's say right now a patient is there in mri machine lying for getting all the mri details if he will come out and go away it will be altogether a tedious task to get the patient again and do the mri if the images are not correct or if there is some problem with the quality and that's why we are creating on premise tool for doing qa qc specifically for mri and we can keep keep it in their system which will not be on the cloud once that is done um, image they need to retake or it is fine 
that will be done on then and there and then they can upload the mri later from any other system which is outside the uh, radiology space then the second problem we usually face or i would say third problem that we usually face is the wariness doctors are not comfortable giving all the images on the cloud until and unless we go through a lot of uh, clearances from the hospital now for data sharing because of which we need a lot of uh, clearance required in the ethical so if we want to scale this can become a huge problem right now still we are in all the validation stage um, so scaling from 10 to 20 20 to 30 is not a problem but when we want to scale on the cloud ethical clearance can become a bottleneck because if they are sharing the data outside the hospital they need to we need to go with them for ethical clearance where we are presenting okay we are doing these 10 things and this is not going to we are not going to use data in xyz way or we are going to use data in xyz way these all things we need to tell it to hospital which becomes a fairly long process for us to go for ethical clearance and also the data clearance and the last problem that we find is regulatory clearance which is again associated with uh, the data when it is coming to cloud so for regulatory clearance we need to show where we are saving the data that is anyways there even in on premise but if it would be on premise it will be a shorter process because we will be sharing data saving data on the same system in the hospital but when it is coming out of from the hospital premises there are a lot of regulatory compliances which we need to keep in place uh, on the cloud so given that there are so many challenges and these challenges are not just one line challenge it, it actually has a lot of cascade reaction in the background so until and unless a company is very sure that they need all the data to do the processing in the background and get to a better result i think uh, the cloud solution can be very tedious because of this so there is one question which is i think we've been answer this where is the patient data coming from <laughs> so uh, obviously it's coming from the hospital and you're taking it from the uh, meta there is one service where you are accessing there is data so you really don't know which patient actually right we have a system uh, in the phase when we are in all these regulatory compliance stage of collecting the clinical data for fda clearance we have medi data in place which does the anonymization part for us and we get anonymized data only and it goes to our uh, cloud and server for getting pro- uh, getting into that processing pod and inferencing pods so all the data from diagnostic yeah just for audience you know you get you keep posting your questions in your in the chat uh, so that we can answer those questions yeah go ahead uh, dr rims so these are the major regulations that we need to go through iso cdsco ctri i have not mentioned over here but ctri is for all the clinical trials uh, which we need to show it to the hospitals for getting ethical clearances fda ge hipa compliance and other medical compliances which are which we are right now in the process of getting the certifications and uh, yeah we are actually now 23 people team not 19 um, i and lina started this company in 2019 uh, my background is in bioinformatics biotechnology then i started working in neurosciences a um, few of my paper are cell signaling which is microbiology and then i started working very deeply into the imaging my phd was in understanding all the functional mri structural mri dmri images using machine learning on top of it to make conclusive predictions for psychiatric disorder like finding out pattern to do the diagnosis or to understand the progression of the psychiatric disorders that is where i started understanding more about these imaging modalities and how it can be used for several diseases i was working predominantly in schizophrenia and obsessive compulsive disorder after which i started working in a startup which was again looking into alzheimers 
and then after that i started uh, working in my own company like we founded this a company whereas lina has a background of first as a software engineer then she did her mba in healthcare she has worked in a lot of very prestigious firms she has done her mba from isb after which she was uh, working with uh, uh, the government for vaccination and healthcare and then we started working together in 2019 and uh, i also wanted to talk about several accelerators and like amplify which because of this i'm here edison and several other accelerator who backed us up to be have two rounds of funding already one was pre seed round which was done by entrepreneur first and later we had a seed round and we have several grants and non dilutive funds from uh, byrak fund and also several government funds Uh, this is our great team we have ml engineers devops uh, product head then packet and engineers we have research team comprising of people who are constantly looking into all the scientific details clinical trials and uh, we have regulatory person we have uh, other engineers in ml so ml neuroimaging or uh, data science they are the maximum in number and rest all Thank you. Is there any other question you can take? Um, yeah, I had I had a question, right? So, uh, yeah. uh, first of all, I think uh, I think in the in if you look at the software engineering pros, uh, you know, profession or I think computer science in general, I think there is a large predominance of uh, I think the the ratio gender ratio is actually very skewed. I think right, uh, not probably not so much in the medical profession, uh, but uh, definitely I think your startup is at the intersection of maybe say. computer science and uh, uh, medical profession so did you face any issues uh, maybe say setting up the team talking to investors getting your customers uh, so did it help you or you know did you feel that there were sometimes barriers in uh, in in actually you know in each of these three uh, stakeholders customers uh, investors and uh, you know hiring the team as well so in terms of hiring the team yes there are many people very uh, gender bias like you we can see a larger number of people who are ml engineer who are male uh, in the coding team we have fewer female as compared to the team in research research and medical team are having equal ratio but yes in coding there is that difficulty we try to balance this as much as we can however the major difficulty we found was getting people who are in who can understand neuroimaging and perform ml on top of it so that was a huge difficulty even in case of signal processing signal mm. processing can be one way how a person can get into the mri processing as well that is where we found difficulty there were very less number of profile to go through but that said if there are any people who are in the uh, in the overlap between these two they are usually really great i mean uh, two three profiles that we found in at the intersection of these two they all were really good and we could get them on board asap um that took us a longer time to get all those kind of engineer the second problem that we found was since it is medical technology also very research oriented medical technology so yes we need to explain to investor much more and <coughs> sorry excuse me and to investor we also need to um say that we have a longer uh, cycle of reaching to market which is slightly challenging for investors to invest if they are looking for immediate uh, huge market then it becomes slightly difficult because we have a lot of regulations and compliances to do and a lot of clearance that we need to take which adds up to our overall uh, cycle to reach to market uh, a longer time so getting those kind of investors is difficult yeah absolutely i think uh... um i think also i think you need investors who uh, not only give you money but also have connections uh, and understand the field well because uh, it is it is maybe not like a 
e-commerce product or uh, you know like a consumer product it it i think the upfront investment is high i think there's a lot of upfront work but i think the, but i think the the flip side of it as as you rightly said i think once you have kind of figured that part out then i think and you are compliant like as and you mentioned you know you are compliant then i think that getting that adoption actually becomes uh, much easier because then you have a mode because because of the upfront investment that you have done i think then i think it becomes in some sense hard to compete with you because every other competitor uh, that comes with you has to kind of do that entire journey again that's where i think you kind of build up that moat as well yes um, cool. uh, yeah uh, vivek do you have any other questions or are there any other questions from the chat i realize we just over time um, uh, and also to dr imjin are there any other aspects that you want to cover as well uh, no that's it i think this itself is a lot of information for people to understand and go yeah. to i would be happy to uh, if they want to connect with me over linkedin and if they want any answer i would be happy to help the startup community yeah it's, it's basically it took me to another world actually like i'm i'm just thinking like how to build such a product like it's so so difficult you know you need to understand deep understanding of the you know the field and understand technology and how to use the technology and you're doing it right as well you know if you see that uh, the architecture it is in in within the vnet and it is part of kubernetes and you have pods been built and you're using all the things right and uh, that's the interesting part of it right so like i am just thinking like wow this is really different and and going in depth into that specific area is very uh, you know very much needed right uh, very interesting yeah. and thank you thank you for being on the show i, I think this is um, this was a really an interesting discussion and it took us to a very different world and we can wait for a minute or so if yeah. there are any questions from the audience you know we can uh, take those questions uh, but yeah no questions from my side probably i'll go back and explore a lot of things about this now <laughs> yeah i think i think uh, yeah there's a lot of in some sense food for thought and i think this was as as we said a fascinating very different world for us as well uh, and and as i said earlier as well i think we, uh, we uh, i think normal normally we don't think about the medical field as much until we have some issue and then we you know like go back and you know talk to doctors and i'm very thankful that you know like uh, like so many doctors actually spend so much time understanding uh, the this part said also at the same time also it's very technology is actually augmenting um uh, you know doctors as well um and uh, for those who are not in the medical profession also i think just as there are advancements in um uh, uh, in in technology uh, right similarly i think there is advancement on in, in medical science and it's kind of getting that interplay we had to talk about the process of how doctors are learning and how you're learning from doctors and how technology is helping doctors understand different aspects so it that interplay was also very fascinating for me uh, so yeah thank you thank you dr rimje for like enlightening us uh, uh, to this part of the world I, i'm sure that you know we'll reference this as well in you know some of the other conversations and as far as the architecture is concerned i think as me and vivek are nodding uh, as well because i think you kind of seem to have like you know gotten many or pretty much all of the aspects right you know, whether it's security whether it's kind of doing isolation whether you're thinking about integration so uh, in fact uh, we didn't even have to ask question because you know while the questions were popping up you were you were, you were answering them as well thank you so much pleasure is all mine and i always love to talk about our company our work because i'm passionate about it so thank you so much for having me here yeah thank you very much uh, by the way for the audience you know who are here um, we were just popping up this uh, all through but i just want to talk a little bit of this uh, we have a link for founders hub and you can apply if you have an idea and you want to build a startup uh, you want to try and you want to meet people there's mentorship and a lot of other things which is there in the founders hub so there is a link there and you can reference the email id which is scaleupthursday@microsoft.com which is our show name so you can use that so that we can get back to you pretty fast so that's one thing and the other thing is uh, interesting is we have an amazing microsoft learn module on building your own startup so there are a bunch of stages of startup right uh, how do you pitch 
and uh, how do you raise funds and uh, how do you come up with the market uh, everything is listed out there so just go back and take it you know take time and read through it uh, that was something which is a very interesting learn module out there so the, as uh, we have come to the closing of this uh, episode there are no more questions so thank you dr rimjim thank you vinak being here thank you rashmita for hosting us thanks all see you next session which is on 22nd 22nd or 23rd 22nd but it's on the microsoft 24th yeah, i got on... everything i got everything wrong <laughs> <laughs> okay it's on 24 so let's meet on 24th on the next episode okay take care bye 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 thanks